Okay. Now back to serious talk. <laughs> I wanted to ask, since we have already talked about this, who amongst you are Buddhists? <laughs> okay. Well, of course. Yeah. What makes you Buddhist? Refuge. Refuge? That's what I'm trying to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many times, yeah, people are born Buddhists. There are so many of I think it's not common in the West, but Asian countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they call themselves <coughs> Buddhists. But they don't know anything about the refuge. They don't know anything about the object of refuge. But just that they are born in the family of Buddhists. Their parents are Buddhists. So they just, I'm a Buddhist. And then even those people who, I mean, they're, 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 they're those who are very, what you call, spiritual and religious, and their understanding of being Buddhist is to go to temple mm -hmm. and make prostrations mm -hmm. and offer incense or maybe a butter lamp. So that is the criteria. That is the defining characteristic of being Buddhist. But that's not it, isn't it? No. Being Buddhist is more than that. That's why I purposely put this, because I don't want to give any clue. <laughs> I underestimated you. <laughs> so refuge. So this, this topic, I think now we are kind of diving into a more serious topic. So far we have talked something general, which can, and you don't have to be a Buddhist to uh, listen to the previous talks is something common but here we are really talking about what you call typical Buddhist philosophy or Buddhist concept but for most of you I think it will be just a revision you already know about this but uh, I think it is very important some people may think that why do we need to seek refuge, you know. But we have been doing that since we are born, since our birth. We constantly seek refuge. When we were toddlers or babies, we always seek refuge in our parents. We always seek protections from our parents or primary caregivers. We are constantly under the protection of somebody else. And then in our life, we face all kinds of difficulties and challenges. We seek various refuge. We don't call it refuge, but it is actually a seeking refuge. When you have difficulty, let's say financial difficulty, you will go to your family, you will go to your friends, somebody to help you out. That is a refuge. And then if you have other difficulties, whatever difficulties, we constantly seek refuge. But these are, these, the seeking refuge is for temporary uh, purpose. But here we are talking about ultimate goals. So if we need to seek refuge in all these conventional goals, temporary goals, then, of course, we need to seek refuge when we are trying to fulfill or achieve our highest goal. So in Lamrim text, when Lama Tsongkhapa explains the topic of refuge, it was explained under four kind of subtopics. So we are going to go through these subtopics one by one. So of course, normally, generally, the refuge is known as the gateway to Buddhist path. 
So this is kind of a defining characteristics of Buddhists and non-Buddhists. If you have refuge in three jewels, if you have taken refuge in three jewels, then you can be counted as a Buddhist. Whereas if you are not, if you have not taken refuge in three jewels, then even if you think that you are a Buddhist, even you go to a temple on daily, I mean, uh, every now and then, or if you spend hours doing meditation, you are not counted as Buddhist. So that's why Buddha refuge is called the gateway to Buddhist path. So the first, there are four subtopics, the causes for going for refuge. First, you need a reason to seek refuge. Even in our conventional world, if you have some, if you are in some predicament, if you have, and you are in a difficult situation, let's say you have some legal issues. So the first thing is you will look for somebody who can help you sort that out. So most likely you will look for a lawyer who can help you out from that issue. And then once you have the reason why you need to seek a lawyer, and then you will go, of course, first you need to have the reason, and then you will, who do I need to go and see? Who, who do I need to seek help from? And then once you identify the person, then, yeah, you need to know how to go about it. And then the stages, then you have to follow the advice. Let's say in, in the case of lawyer, then lawyer will advise you to do this and this. He will give you some uh, specific instructions to go about on, uh, regarding this issue. And that's how you go about uh, solving your problem or fulfilling that purpose. So likewise, when it comes to taking refuge, so first important thing is the causes, the reason why we need to seek refuge. So there are two reasons, those senior students, what are the two reasons? Come on. Changing, uh, transforming the mind from affliction. Two causes of refuge, yeah? Anthony said like that. What else? Come on! <laughs> <laughs> you have been studying and attending teachings. <laughs> to to all seek enlightenment it. for the sake of all beings. I mean, ultimate. Is that it? Suffering. Suffering, suffering. Free from but what you obtain the instructions free from something free from something I am shocked <laughs> <laughs> anybody okay because we don't know <laughs> yes okay. oh, I knew that. the first one is fear of the suffering of lower realms <laughs> Of course, it's the fear. But here we call yeah. lower end because this is talking from the point of the person of me, uh, small scope. Small scope's goal is to ensure a good rebirth. Mm -hmm. So, so this is this is one. This is so important. You really need to understand the two causes, because Lama Tsongkhapa says that the quality of your refuge is contingent on the quality of these two causes. Mm. That is understandable, isn't it? If the seed is a real good quality ones, then it will produce, it can produce, uh, or it can yield a good product. If the seed is medio, what's that, mediocre? Mediocre. Mediocre, mediocre. Yeah. then of course the result will be also mediocre. Of course, there's, there's no seed. If it's a rotten or burned seed, then it won't produce anything. So the quality of your refuge is dependent on the quality of this. But if you don't know the causes, 
then there's no way you will be able to generate refuge. Mm. You want to? Yeah. No, no. Okay. Yeah. So, at the moment, we are so fortunate. It is normally our obtaining human rebirth is likened to uh, what do you call the light produced by lightning mm -hmm. in the dark, stormy night mm -hmm. when there is the a flesh. lightning, the flesh. Mm -hmm. It can illuminate mm -hmm. things very briefly. Mm -hmm. So that's that's all, you know. All most of our life we are in the lower realm. Remember we cover about cover on that. The turtle, the blind turtle. Mm -hmm. The turtle all most of the time it's underwater. It's on the bottom of the sea. But only once in a while it <coughs> pops up on the surface. That is like we obtaining human rebirth, human birth, human life. So we are so fortunate to have this life. But this life will not last forever. <coughs> we already discussed about the impending death. Any moment, first of all, death is certain. We will die eventually. Let's say, in 100, all those who are gathered here in 50 years' time, I think we will be gone. But then, yeah, there's no guarantee that we will live up to, you know, so, I don't know, 80 years, 90 years. The time of death is uncertain. We can die any time. Once the death comes, even though our body may be cremated or buried or whatever, we but our consciousness still has to go on. We still have to take another form. And we don't have choice. If we have choice, of course we can say, that, oh, I want to be born as a, I don't know, uh, as a prince or princess, or son of a wealthy family, billionaire, all this. But we have no choice. It is all determined by our karma. So karma, there are two karma, positive karma, negative karma. The, the results, consequences of these karmas are fixed. The result of negative karma is negative. lower rebirth. The positive karma is higher rebirth. So it's fixed. So you cannot hope that, you know, to be born in higher realms we are after cultivating or accumulating negative karma. There is no way. You have to follow. It corresponds. Positive karma and negative karma corresponds with the result of higher rebirth and lower rebirth. And when we look inside, we know. We say the round of round of kotu That means what we are doing what we are thinking, nothing is, uh, what do you call? Now I'm stuck. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know what, what we do. We know our action. So if we really observe and honestly observe our actions, we know that if you really weigh the two, negative karma and positive karma, this will down. Negative karma will pull down. It's so heavy. We have talked about the analogy of beggar's possession and the king's treasure. Our negative karma is like the royal treasure. We could produce all sizes, all kinds, all variety. There's plenty. But when it comes to positive karma, it's like beggar's possession. First of all, beggars do not have that much. And even if they have a not good quality one, it's all used one, broken one, cracked one, 
dented one. That we can tell when we sit down and try to do meditation. That I tell from I can tell from my own experience. I do my prayer in the morning. And then I was doing something and suddenly yeah, I'm distracted. Start with good motivation and then I don't know where I was. Suddenly I've already finished that prayer. That happens to all of us. First of all, there is no motivation, good motivation. We are most of the time, what do you call, motivated by worldly concerns. We do prayer for our long life. We do prayer for wealth. We do prayer for our daughters and sons to have a successful life, good career. We hardly do any practice with pure motivation to achieve enlightenment. It is very rare our practice is motivated by compassion or bodhicitta. So from the beginning, our practice is already the quality, there's no quality. And then in the middle, why we are doing, there's a lot of distractions. That's why I remember I was saying that. The saying is that if you need to remember something, try to meditate. That's when you are able to remember all the things that you need to do. That's that we can tell from our own experience. When we sit down and do something, all kinds of thoughts pops up. Oh, I need to do this. Oh, I need to. It's like something you never think of that, and that somehow it comes here. And then at the end, normally, to conclude your prayer, you will need to dedicate the prayer. Do we do that? We hardly do that. Even if we do our dedication, we be all oh, from this merit. May I have lots of wealth. <laughs> may I get a good job, isn't it? May I have a good health. May I live long. All for worldly purposes. So if you add all this up, if you take all this into consideration, the likelihood of going up and going down is so clear. We will be, most certainly. The likelihood is to go down. And then if we are born, let's not talk about hell and all this. Just animal, if we are born as animal. Of course people say that. In America, to be born as dog and cats, very fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> How about if it's half and half? How about if it's half and half positive and negative karma? What happens? Okay. If it's Let's equal. say even if you think that you have half and half, no, I'm not thinking, I'm no, just let's asking. Say, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let, let's say if you have half and half. But which one you pick on is all dependent on at the time, the mind frame at the time of death. Right. Okay. So if you are not habituated, if you're not if your habit is not to have positive mind at the time of death to generate a positive mindset is very hard to come by. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of confusion. So it is very hard. So when you have this fear, confusion, and worse even, if your attachment to your, I don't know, whoever you are leaving behind, then it will pick on the negative karma. Even though you have that heart waiting, mm -hmm. it's like, pick me up, pick me up, but no. It chooses the other one. Thank you. So from all this, we know, I can tell that, oh, if I die today, wow, it's really, yeah, it's like <laughs> going down. So you see, even if we are, that's, a, that's what I'm saying, let's not talk about hell and all this, but born as animal. Imagine if you are born as animal, as, you know, cow in those slaughterhouses. You may have seen those videos. And those chickens, it's packed, you know, there's not even <coughs> enough space to stand. And then we also see pictures of, you know, animals being skinned alive. Imagine if you are born 
in this kind of animal. Then imagine some anim animals, even mostly you will see that in India, dogs, walking, looking, searching for, what is that one? Scraps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Foraging. 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 Yeah. Foraging for food and drink. <coughs> they haven't eaten, they haven't eaten for days. You can see that tummy. Yeah. <laughs> and then no water, thirst. And that not just animal. We have news in Ethiopia and all this, in some of the countries. People die from starvation and thirst. Imagine if you are born in that kind of land. So that's why we have this fear. Oh, I have not prepared. So if I die today, oh, there is a likelihood that I will be born in there. If I will. If I were, if I were to, if I am born in this kind of environment, then I will experience, I will go through so much torment, so much suffering. So that's why you look for refuge. So there's this fear that, so now you're looking for protection or protector. You're looking for refuge. That's why it says one of the reason is, one of the causes is, Fear of the suffering of lower rebirths. The second one. What, what is your? Ah, there you go. It's okay. down the bottom. Down there. Yeah. Okay. The confidence that the three jewels have the ability to protect one from that misery. So first, you need to have this fear, and then you search for the refuge, and then you see three jewels. And then you need to have this confidence, this faith that yes, the three jewels have the ability, have the capability to really, uh, what do you call it, rescue me or prevent me or protect me from being born in lower ranks. So these two, very, very important. So when we try to generate uh, Refuge. So first we have to contemplate on these two points. Only when we have these two points strongly generated, only then you will be able to generate refuge, real refuge. So now, what are the objects of refuge? Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Every session at the beginning we recite that i go for refuge to buddha dharma sangha so what is buddha buddha is in tibetan we call it sangha it's free from all impurity and realize anything that has to be realized so there's nothing no more learning so that's, that's what we call Buddha. So how did Buddha become like that? Buddha one time, it was like us, full of rife with afflictive emotions. The way we get angry, hatred, jealous, all this. Yeah, Buddha used to get that. But Buddha realized that these are the cause of suffering. And then Buddha meditated and then what do you call? Realize various parts. And then through these parts, Buddha is what is called cessation of suffering, various levels of suffering. So these are called Dharma. These realizations, these cessations are called Dharma. And then those who possess those realizations, those who pursue the spiritual path, spiritual goal. These are called Sangha. So these are the three objects of refuge. So why do we go, why do we rely on Buddha as our refuge? So there are many reasons, but Lamrim, uh, what do you call 
uh, summarized into four reasons. The first reason is that the Buddha has attained the fearless state of complete self-control. So which means that Buddha is free for all suffering. Buddha has achieved enlightenment. Buddha has practiced all these paths and have eradicated, eradicated, eradicated uprooted all the afflictive emotions and delusions that give rise to suffering. So if we want to rely on somebody, if we want to seek refuge in somebody, we need to look for some person who himself is free of all the sufferings. So normally the analogy is that, you know, a person who is singing himself, let's say scent, what do you call the quicksand. Mm -hmm. If two people, they are in quicksand, there's no way that, you know, one can help the other one. You need somebody who is outside the sandwich, who has already, you know, who's not in the same, same boat. So Buddha, that's why one reason is that Buddha has already, uh, what do you call, eliminate all fears. So that's why he can be able to help us remove uh, or protect us from all the fears, all the fear. That's the first reason. The second reason is that even if you have all that, you know, if you are free from all suffering and all this, if you are, if you don't have the skill to help the person to rescue, if you don't have the rescuing skill, then yeah, your quality may not be useful. In the text, it is says that it's like a handicapped mother. So the mother sees that her son is drowning in the water there. But because she is handicapped, she cannot do anything. Even if she really wants to help, she doesn't have the means to help the, uh, her, her, her son or her baby. But Buddha is not like that. Buddha has all the skills. Sometimes, you know, uh, helping people is not just your intention. Sometimes we think that, oh, you know, you say and do this thing. Because, oh, you know, I just want to help him. But you need to be skillful. If you are not skillful, then what will happen is you will drive the person away. So let me tell you a story. So I know of a friend who himself is really into practice and he wanted his daughters to follow because he to him is like this is the path you should choose so every sunday their daughters teenagers he will make them do recitation for hours and they really hated that they really hated that because they have no choice mm -hmm. kind of forced to do it <laughs> and then they went to the States and they got to, one of the daughters got to attend Kishi uh, Tudinjimba's talk on Buddhist uh, philosophy. So the university invited Kishi Lao to give a talk on transformation and she was able to attend that and then she called father said why didn't you tell me that Buddhism is all about transformation of mind? <laughs> if you would have told me that I would have done, you know, all those, you know, with sincere heart and, you know, genuinely. So you see, there's this danger. If she had not attended the talk, she would never come back to. She would have never. Let, let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. it's less likelihood that she would have come back to Buddhism because to her, her experience was not a happy one. So sometimes we have to be careful. We mean well, but you also have to see. That's why His Holiness, whenever 
His Holiness gave teachings. His Holiness always emphasized not to change your religion. Because sometimes, you know, suddenly you, you come across a line and then you are so, you know, moved, inspired, and you suddenly want to become a Buddhist. And we have seen those people. And they are so much into this for a few years, and then suddenly they lost faith. So, we need to be skilled, and Buddha has that skill. And I think you know the story. There are many stories. One of the stories is the Lam Chungpa story. Are you familiar with that story? Who is so dull. You see, he couldn't even memorize one word. If you are not skillful like Buddha, you know, person would have given up on him. But Buddha being skillful, so he first asked him to sweep, and then asked him to clean the monk's robe, the monk's shoes. And through practice, through purification, practice of purification, and eventually he achieved arhatship. Arhatship, is it? Arhathut or arhatship? Arhathut. He became Arya. Arhat. He became Arhat. So this shows that Buddha is skilled in leading people, leading us to there. Then the third reason, the Buddha has great compassion. Even if you are free from all suffering and if you have skills, if you don't have compassion, then you may not be interested to help. Even if you see that person suffering, oh, it's none of my business. But Buddha is not like that. The whole purpose of Buddha achieving enlightenment is driven by this strong wish to help sentient beings. That's why in Bodhicitta we make a jump. We say that in order to achieve, uh, for the sake of sentient beings, to benefit other sentient beings, <coughs> may I achieve enlightenment. <coughs> you may wonder why so the main goal is to help sentient beings. At the moment, I don't have the ability to help all sentient beings. Forget about helping all sentient beings. We don't even have the potential to help liberate one person. So when will we have the potential or the ability to do so? That is only when we achieve enlightenment. So that's why we are making this. I want to liberate all sentient beings, so I want to achieve enlightenment. So the Buddha's goal, the whole purpose is to help others. So once, who, once he achieved that, once Buddha's achieved that, there is no way that Buddha will not help. So that's why Buddha has great compassion. So we have to go to a, ref to a refuge. We have to seek a refuge that we know can help us. Then the Buddha works for the sake of all, whether they have helped him or not. Sometimes, you know, if we are just compassionate, then what will happen is we will only help those, you know, who are nice to you. That's why the reason in Lamrim is called Buddha does not, uh, Buddha is not pleased by material offerings. So if Buddha is just pleased by material offerings, then there is this danger. Oh, Ken has been very generous to me. Mm. I should help Ken. Oh, Carolyn. Jocelyn. Jocelyn. Huh? Jocelyn. Carolyn. Jocelyn, Jocelyn. Carolyn, there. Yeah. Ah. Jocelyn. Oh, she's not that nice to me. I don't want to help you. <laughs> but it's not like that. Regardless of whether you praise Buddha or not, even whether, whether you offer prostration to Buddha or not, Buddha will still help anybody. So that is why I normally explain to people about, to 
in puja. It's like Buddha's, Buddha's hand is always stretched towards us. It is just that we lack this hanging on to it. I think you have come across this story. There was a, I think there was a flood somewhere. And this guy was struggling and he was praying to God. God help me, you know, save me, save me. And then yeah, eventually he died. He has been calling for help to God for this like Christian. And so yeah, the story goes like this. So he after that he went to heaven and saw God and he questioned God. How come, you know? I asked for your help and you never helped me. The God said, yeah, the first time you asked, I threw a tree trunk there. You did not grab on it. You didn't grab it. And second time I threw something else. You just ignore it. So how can I help you? Similar to this story is that there was this person who has been praying to God to win a lottery. <laughs> And then, yeah, he went to heaven and then, yeah, yeah, I prayed. I asked you to, you know, for me to win a lottery, but you didn't help. Said, but you never bought a ticket. <laughs> 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 yeah. So Buddha's helping hand is always there. But we need to create the ring. The hook is there, or the ring is there. But we need to create a hook. Only then there is a chance that, you know, we can be liberated. Okay, let's stop here for our tea. Okay, that's a quiz. So what are the four reasons? <laughs> <laughs> the four causes? Uh, the four, reason, yeah. four reasons why we need to go for refuge in Buddha. Not to have a lower reverb. Oh, yeah. Come on. Fear, 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 fear of lower reverb. Fear of lower reverb. No, 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 no. The four reasons. Oh. Oh. The reasons why they are worthy to be refuge. Buddha has compassion for us. Buddha has compassion. Buddha has compassion. Mm -hmm. Skill. Skill. Buddha has the skill. Compassion. Yeah, compassion, skill, okay. He himself has complete self control. Yes already yeah, master the path or whatever he is, he's already achieved enlightenment, okay? Mm -hmm. Works for all of us. Works for the sake of all. Works for the sake of all, yeah. It doesn't, you know, irrespective of, you know, whether the person benefits him or not, he will still have. So for Buddha, the best offering is your practice. If you practice, Buddha will be pleased. But of course, you can make offerings. But offerings, yeah, it is for you to cultivate merit. Mm -hmm. But Buddha may not be that place if you just, you know, make material offerings, but you don't practice. But if you practice and if you don't make any this kind of material offerings, Buddha would be still very pleased. So the Buddha has attained the fearless state of complete self-control. Mm -hmm. The Buddha is skilled in the means to free others from dangers. The Buddha has great compassion. And finally, the Buddha works for the sake of all, whether they have helped him or not. So now we go on turn on the third subtopic, which is how to go for refuge. So we too, we, have, we need to go for refuge, understanding the qualities of Buddha. So what is Buddha? Okay, I think. Yeah, so this in Lamlim, it is explained uh, based on the three aspects of Buddha's qualities. So there are the qualities, are uh, the knowledge, speech, no, body, speech, and mind, mind the three qualities. Mm. So Buddha's, the quality of Buddha's body, 
So I think commonly we know about this. 32, what's that? 32? Marks. Marks and 80? Signs. Signs. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> I'm not going to uh, enumerate each and every one, but just to give you an idea that according to Lamrim, in order to produce one poor Buddha's poor P O R E mm -hmm. you need to have the combination let's put it this way if you put all together the merits of hearers and solitude realizers as well as the emperors if you put all that merit together that is only enough to produce one poor and then the merit to produce all that Buddha's paw, there will be countless paws, that merit can only produce one of the major marks. So imagine. And Buddha's body, to illustrate the quality of Buddha's body, there is a stanza. Tibetans like, of course this is from Sanskrit, but Tibetans also like to write uh, in the form of poetry. It is quite beautiful. A bee, a bee, seeing both the lotus of your face and the lotus that is opened by the sun, would hesitate, suspended in doubt about which is the real flower. It is so pretty that you know, even bees, of course this is in a poetry form, has to be, you know, make sure that which is the real one. So of course, in our conventional world, we have those movie stars and people rave about it. And I know of somebody who says, who, who likes uh, Hugh Jackman. <laughs> she was, oh, I would like to. <laughs> like, you know, like this kind of on my toes. So we, 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 we see those those even conventional the, the look. We find them so handsome and so on. But if all that put together and you compare with Buddha, it will the difference will be like in Tibetan we call it earth and sky the difference is what buddha is of course it's a buddha buddha i have achieved enlightenment <coughs> purified all the imperfections so it's what is called immaculate infallible immaculate mm -hmm. immaculate and infallible infallible am i saying correctly mm -hmm. yes okay. yeah it's faultless it's perfection beyond i don't know perfection. So that's Buddha's. And the one, one, of, one of the main quality is that if you see Buddha, there is no, what do you call, there's always joy and inspires you. There is no way that negative emotions arises. It's never displeasing. It is always so peaceful just to see. Sometimes, you know, we, we see a practitioner like Great Lama, like His Holiness. When we see His Holiness, how, how do we feel emotionally? It's the, it kind of fills us with serene kind of, you know, emotion. So that's, that's His Holiness is there, and Buddha is supposed to have all that quality. His Holiness manifested as ordinary person. So he has to, uh, what do you call, display kind of, the ordinary person's uh, aspects. But Buddha is a Buddha. So imagine if we have that kind of, you know, response to His Holiness. Imagine how would we feel if we are able to be in front of Buddha Himself. So that's Buddha's <coughs> uh, body. So it talks about Buddha's com complexion. We care so much about complexion. Mm -hmm. One time, I have a friend, my actually my my cousin. 
So she visited me in monastery and then yeah, I was drinking tea. <coughs> so I like to drink, you know, quite strong tea. And she advised me, oh, don't drink, drink uh, strong tea. It will affect your complexion. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, Buddha's complexion is just this golden complexion, extraordinary radiant and rich luster. In Tibetan, we have a phrase when we describe somebody nice looking. Karsa karla, marsa mar. That means wherever it has to be white, it is white. Mm -hmm. Wherever it has to be red, it is red. <laughs> so it's perfect. Mm. And we spend, not we, yeah, people <laughs> spend <laughs> quite a lot of time in front of your mirror. makeup mirror. <laughs> <laughs> and I was actually really surprised at the the price of those, you know, oh, yeah. the cosmetics people buy. So expensive. It's just you buy this uh, and, <laughs> in. Uh, of course, I I I I I spent many years in Malaysia. It's a ringgit. It's like just this is four hundred ringgit. That's oh. like wow. <laughs> and then yeah, just not one enough, isn't it? You have to buy the foundation and then what else? I don't know. <laughs> so many. Yeah, but if you achieve enlightenment, you don't need it. <laughs> you would have natural compassion. Yes. When His Holiness was here doing the initiation for Medicine Buddha, he said, uh, he commented on the uh, cosmetic and he said that the real beauty is the inner beauty. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, of course, of yeah, course. That's, that's the quality, of the enlightened mm -hmm. quality. Yes, yes. So if you, you have the inner beauty, then that outer beauty automatically comes, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's true, you know. If you know of a person who is by heart, is a very good person, you tend to like him despite his look. Right. But whereas if somebody, you know, physically, that will attract him, all this thing, but you know that person, of course, first time when you meet the person, you don't know the person. But after knowing the person, no matter how attractive that person is, you kind of don't want to associate with that. So that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. where, you know, this inner beauty comes in. And then the Buddha's speech. So this is, I always like this. Yeah, so this one says that Buddha's speech is such that if all the people, all the sentient beings, if they pose a caution, ask a caution in their own language, that would be like multiple languages. If you ask that in one instant, mm -hmm. Buddha would answer instantly with just one utterance. That is the quality of the speech. For us, you know, even if we speak the language, we have difficulty understanding. But for Buddha, if you just ask one question, he comprehends all that question and then answer not just answer according to your mental disposition and what is the other word? Prediction, isn't it? Prediction. Mm. It's, it's also, it's like the speech that harmonizes with, with all sentient beings. Um, that's in the um, um, Samantha Bhadra, the, the prayer. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like this. And then I think there are some lamas when you attend the teachings and uh, there is this common occurrence that people say, oh, the Lama answered my doubt. Lama answered my question. Right. I think that's common with Lama Subha mm -hmm. Those who have attended Rinpoche's teaching, so Rinpoche's teaching, some of the teachings is like, there's not much structure. It's like here, there. But then people come back, oh, I was, you know, this, this, I have this doubt and the she just answered my question. I just want, it's like clairvoyance. 
And then Buddha's speech, one another quality is that the Shariputra, he attempted to, you know, measure how far Buddha's speech can reach. Because a Shariputra has miracles to fly to, you know, different uh, continents. And he, using his miracles, he flew to all that different, different realms. But even he has traveled for, I don't know, thousands and thousands of miles. But he could still hear the Buddha as if he is in front of Buddha. So that we can comprehend because in Tibet, those days, like Yajipamunga Rinpoche and all this, when they give teachings, at those days we didn't have microphone, we didn't have sound box, there's no sound system. And there will be thousands and thousands of people attending teachings. And how could people hear that if they don't have that kind of quality? And I think it was, uh, yeah, since I'm not very sure, I won't name the person. But uh, yeah, I heard that when the Lama, sometimes what happened is when Rinpoche's give initiations, those who are in the front rows, like normally, uh, Rinpoche's will be sitting in the front. So sometimes the main Lama will ask the Rinpoche's to go and place that object, you know, during the empowerment. So they say that when they go and all this thing, so they normally sit in the front. And when they are at the back, they will still hear the same volume. So that's incredible. And for me, Obviously, I don't have that quality because the first day people couldn't hear. It was sitting just at the back. And I have to use this. But if I have that Buddha's quality of speech, I don't need to use this. Even people sitting, you can just listen at your home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's Buddha's quality of speech. And then it comes to mind, the quality of mind. That's the main. So it's, it's kind of divided into three aspects, the knowledge, and then with us compassion, and then what is called the power of the activity. So with us knowledge, there is a stanza, I think that explains all. Only your wisdom pervades all objects of knowledge. There are objects yet to be known by everyone other than you. So normally for us is, you know, the other objects overwhelm our knowledge. Even this room, there are so many things that we don't know. We cannot even perceive. But for Buddha, whatever exists, Buddha knows. It's like Buddha's knowledge or awareness pervades all that is, that all that exists. So there's nothing to be learned, nothing that Buddha knows. And it says that the analogy is that if you have that tamarind seed pot, is it? We used to school, we used to play this. Imli. Imli do. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I used to play at school. You know those seeds? Yeah. You can yeah. throw and then you can, you know, play a game. Mm -hmm. So for Buddha, it's like, if you are holding those seeds in your palm, then you can see so clearly, nothing to obscure you. So for Buddha, it's like this. Everything is like looking in the palm of your hand. It's like those, I don't know if there's some, some movies portray that witches look in the mirror, you know, it's like you can see everything there. So Buddha's mind is like that. There's nothing that Buddha know of. He says, Lord Buddha, every aspect of arising of every phenomena throughout time is within the scope of your mind, seen like a tamarind pot in your head. If you ask Buddha, you know, what is the karma of us being together <coughs> here right now at this <coughs> Buddha would explain. Oh, you know, some 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 lifetime, you know, you are this, this, you are this. Each and every, with each and every detail. 
each and every minute details Buddha can explain. That's, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have that kind of mind, isn't it? But it's not something, you know, it's up there and which, which is not, you know, within our reach. We have the potential. Nothing to be discouraged. We should be instead inspired. We have the potential. If we practice, as I mentioned earlier, Buddha's mind was once like ours. Cannot comprehend, you know, only what it is obvious. But then through practice, through training, he was able to progress to the level where there's nothing, nothing to be known anymore. If new thing appears, if Apple comes up with a new version of iPad or iPhone, but I knows. Doesn't have to see it. <laughs> and then the Buddha's compassion. As, we, as I mentioned earlier, the whole purpose of this, working so hard in the path, is to benefit sentient beings. So that's why Buddha yeah, constantly actually looking at us, looking for ways to help us, always wishing that I hope these people do this way, I wish they follow this, they do this, I wish they stop doing that. We don't realize that. And sometimes we argue in movies they show here. Yeah? Especially in the Hindi movies, they will go to the temple and they will quarrel with the god. The stage of how dare you know you let it happen this way. But it is important to how Buddha Buddha has compassion, no doubt. But then you may wonder then how come? You know, I have been praying and praying all my life and things never go right. But praying is one thing, but you have to really practice. You think that just offering a stick of incense is too much that you have done, you know. It's like, I have offered you incense. Why can't you <laughs> grant me this? <laughs> yeah. So, I think we, uh, I have uh, cited this quote before. How Buddha help us, how refuge help us. It's not that, you know, when we go for refuge and Buddha will just bless us and that's it. So it says, in Buddhist tradition, there is no such thing as cleansing our negativities through water. Like Hindus, they believe that if you bathe in River Ganga, or Ganges, or Ganga, we call it Ganga, so that, oh, all your negativities will be purified. So that's why there are special months where you cannot even find a spot in that uh, River Ganga there. People will be all bathing, and every year there are many people killed from storm pit. Hmm. People really believe that, and they go and bathe in there. And then they think that yes. And I think in other traditions also there's something called absolve, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You go and confess and yeah, you are now absolved of your mm -hmm. sins or negativities. But in Buddhist tradition, there is no way that one can purify our negativities by simply taking a bath in, uh, let's say, holy water. And then there is no way that, you know, Buddha just placed the hand on us and removes all the sufferings. If they were, if, if this were possible, Buddha would have done that. Why wouldn't? That's his main purpose, to liberate us from suffering. And if that can be done, why wouldn't he do that? We wouldn't be here anymore. We would be somewhere, you know, become Buddha. <laughs> but that is not the case. And then he says that Buddha cannot transfer his realizations. Buddha has achieved all the realizations. 
if Buddha can share with us, that would be wonderful. And Buddha would happily do that. But that's not possible. So the only way that Buddha can help us is that Buddha show us the path and then we practice. There is no other way. There is no shortcut. Even though we are what we call uh, instant, we live in instant culture, we live, we survive on instant gratification. gratification. I'm so sorry, there is no, <laughs> no shortcut. We have to practice. So that's how we are. We need to understand. If we don't understand this, what happens is there are cases, and recently I learned about this, that uh, there was this lady who was supposedly very uh, strong in a, uh, not strong, I won't put it this way, kind of staunch Buddhist seemingly staunch Buddhist. And when her son or daughter died, it was a certain death. When she lost her daughter, certainly, and then she threw the statue down. That shows, you know, the level of your understanding of refuge. That shows the level of your understanding of what Buddhism is about is that I am Buddhist and this shouldn't happen to me. Mm -hmm. Buddha, you didn't help me. You didn't prevent that. So now I don't want to be a Buddhist. So first of all, this is all about karma. Karma kind of exceeds is it, Buddha's power. Buddha is capable I mean, Buddha's capability is unimaginable, but when it comes to individual karma, Buddha cannot do anything. And then people, when, of course we will discuss this in our later classes, but we need to understand when it comes to karma, it is not about just about this life. Many people ask, yeah, it is very relevant, why Trump is so successful? Why he is so lucky? That, that, what was that, unemployment rate mm. is the lowest <laughs> in five decades or something. And he was able to nominate two conservative judges there. Why, we would ask, isn't there karma? <laughs> That's exactly what somebody asked. Where is your karma? And he is like this way, but look at how he is. I mean, kind of uh, achieving. So if we look, we we think in this narrow scope of this, just this life, then we think that, oh, you started to doubt about this karma, concept of karma. How come, you know? And many people said, how come I am sick? I live my life, what do you call, uh, ethically. That's why those people cancer people, they often raise this question, why me? Why me? I have been good. How come? And look at them. He is the, you know, cunning and all the time deceitful. He has done this and this and this. Look at him. He's so healthy. He's so well off. <coughs> what happened to karma? But karma is not about this life. It is many lives time. You may live very well in this life, but you may have done something in your previous lives. That's what you're experiencing. And in monastery, great lamas, all kind of pass away from all kind of these rare sicknesses, cancer, Parkinson, what not. Even some people have stroke and bedridden for years. And you wonder, how come these are supposed to be, you know, practitioners? But then there's explanation. Because those practitioners, when in their past life they have accumulated 
negativities. So in this lifetime, they <coughs> and they kind of what is that word? Attenuate, mm, reduce, mm -hmm. reduce the lessening. Yeah, lessening or minimizing the the weight of the consequences. Let's say if the karma is heavy enough to bring the person to lower them, but through this life's practice, right. they reduce that and try to experience in this life. Yeah, purifying. Yeah. Purifying. Mm -hmm. So of course, if you are able to purify right. all, that will be good. Holy, that if you are able to purify holy, that is the first aim. If not, at least reduce that instead of going to be born right. in this thing. You experience this in life, in different forms of these are sicknesses. So that's what we do. So if you have understood your karma, you actually instead of you know like how come you know being suspicious and doubtful, you will generate faith. Oh, great practitioner, able to do that. That's important. So that's how yeah we have to remember. Sometimes we feel oh I have taken refuge so now I should be okay. No unless you put effort into practice. There is no way but I can do. There's nothing but I can do unless you put effort. I want to stress on that. Then we have Dharma. So Dharma, what is Dharma actually? Yeah, if you ask this question in Tibetan lay community, they will point to what I have here picture. That's not Dharma. That's not actual Dharma. Dharma, actual Dharma, when he talks about the three jewels, Dharma in the context of three jewels, is the realizations of those who have achieved direct uh, perception into, direct insight into emptiness we call Arya beings. The realizations of these beings are called Dharma. And then of course, since we go for refuge in Dharma, we also have to show the same respect to these Dharma scriptures. Then Sanghas. The Sanghas are individuals who have attained the Arya stage. So those who have all these, those who possess those realizations, these are called Sangha. So normally, commonly, let's put it, commonly the three jewels are explained using the metaphor of doctor, patient, medicine, medicine. and patient. Patient. come on! Patient. Keep patient. No, no, taking the, the staff, medicine. The staff, no, the nurses. Doctor, the medicine. Oh, well, the, the nurses. Nurses, yes, yes. okay, nurses. Nurse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We flunk. <laughs> mm. I think you didn't get your coffee, is it? <laughs> yeah. So, Buddha is like doctor. So when we have, when we have illnesses, the first thing is we will go to see a doctor. Then doctor will check your pulse or whatever, you know, check up and then Buddha will diagnose. Oh, you have that sickness. You have afflictive emotions. You have anger, jealousy. <coughs> you have self-grasping. You have self-cherishing thought. These are the uh, illnesses and the causes. And then, with a, then the doctor will say, okay, you have to take this pill. And then the nurses and all this will help you take the pills on time. So likewise, we have been suffering from this chronic illness from the beginningless time. Life after life, we, we are going through the same sickness. And now Buddha says that you have this illness. So you have to take the medicine that is Dharma. Then while we are taking the medicine, so we have this Sangha to inspire us in our path. When we see that this Sangha, be, sangha 
who have this realization, we kind of get encouraged. Oh, it is not something elusive. It's not something unachievable. Since they are there, you know, who has all this realization, then I do too. So that's how we get inspired when you see Sangha. Member of Sangha, they say Sangha. So that's how uh, these three uh, jewels are explained. And now, what are the benefits? You are included amongst Buddhists. We discussed that already. This is the defining uh, character, characteristic. So once you have taken refuge, once you have refuge, then you will be considered as Buddhist. And then you become worthy to offer all the vows. So all the vows, like Prati Moksha vow, what is called self-liberation vows, and then Bodhisattva vows, Tantri vows, all need to have the foundation of refuge. If you don't have refuge, you will not be able to receive these vows. Then you reduce and eliminate previously accumulated karmic obscurations. So if you have refuge, then there is a chance that you will be able to reduce that. Even you know about these four opponent powers when we purify negativities. The first one is refuge. The reason why there's refuge and bodhicitta is that most of our negativities we commit in relation to three jewels or sentient beings. Because of that, to counter these two, we have refuge and bodhicitta. So that is the foundation. So there is a oh, time is a canonic story. Then you will accumulate was married. So at the moment we may think that oh that's not true, you know. I have taken refuge and you know I am not accumulating a lot of merit. But that's you know you have to really check whether you have a good quality refuge. If you really have good quality refuge, which is triggered or motivated or propelled by these two causes, then there's constant fear, constant, uh, what do you call, the insecurity, sense of insecurity. That will really drive you to do all the virtuous things. That's how you, that's how you will accumulate. For us, merit. For us, our quality of refuge is so poor that it has no effect on us. But if you have the real refuge, definitely, every or most of the time you will be cultivating virtue. And that's where you will accumulate was merit. And then you will not fall into the miserable realms. Of course, if you practice, then you have these positive karmas that will bring you to higher rebirth instead of lower rebirth. You will not. The important thing is when you go for real refuge, you will follow the instructions of Buddha. So that is, do not commit negativities. Do all virtuous things. So you will do that. If you follow that, there is no way you will be born in lower realms. So that's how the refuge prevents you from falling into the lower realms. You will be not you will not be taunted by human or non-human hindrances. This I must tell you a story. <coughs> this was a story in a lemon. So there were two or three robber uh, thieves. They went to steal in a monk's room, but they caught they are caught by monks. So the monks put their hands there and they started to beat them by saying, Sandhya like Tiao Su Chow, Chu like Tiao Su Chow, Gindu like Tiao Su Chow. So that means I go for refuge. Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. So there. And then they let them go. 
And then when on their return, they have to pass through a location where it is known to have all these spirits, you know. So as they were walking there, they were, they were talking to each other, oh, so lucky that there are only three of these, you know, only the Slam, Sangye, Chuk, Gindu, well, if there were more of this, we will finish. <laughs> and because they said it this way, and of course the spirits, because of just uttering these words, they were not harmed. They couldn't be harmed. They were protected. So there's no intention. Just relaying the story, it got protected. So imagine if you really do with your uh, heart in it. And uh, this this was recently. So there was, I think, the past uh, Gandhi the, the immediate one who recently passed away. So he was uh, visiting Texas. And then <coughs> they brought in a lady who is possessed, who was possessed. So the accompanying Rinpoche, so he's my friend. So Rinpoche thought that, oh, the two Rinpoche will, you know, visualize into Yemen Taka and do something wrathful things to chase away the spirit. And then Rinpoche said, okay, come, 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 bring me in. And then he just took his text, the prayer text, said, Lama la jya su sanje la jya su chyo la jya su chyo, gindu la jya su chyo. So that's all he did. And later Rinpoche kind of remarked and uh, uh, commented to Rinpoche that, you know, well, come on, I, I thought that you were between some Yemen Taka or some, you know, that, that kind of wrathful puja. But you know, Lama, what are you talking about? The refuge is the main one. That was the answer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't realize that. We think that, oh, there's something better and, you know, greater besides the, the, the refuge. I used to think that. That was a wake of call for me. That's very common in Tibetan community. Especially when they are applying for visa to go to America or anywhere. <laughs> they will wake up early in the morning at 5 and go to offer tea offering to the protector when they have Buddha in their house. But they don't trust Buddha. They think that making this prayer to Buddha will not fulfill. They feel that, oh, going to some wrathful one, that's more effective. You see, that's our thinking. If you have real refuge, you will not do that. You will accomplish everything you wish. If you have real refuge, why do you think that you will accomplish? Yeah, let me throw this question. If you have refuge, okay. Well, the word you use is real, uh, real refuge. Mm. Everything you wish for will be um, virtuous, mm -hmm. and that you will, you know you will attain virtuous results. It doesn't mean that you can have anything. Anything you will mm. only only choose to to wish for virtuous things. Yeah. So normally there's a saying, So if you are meritorious, if you have a lot of merits, then all your wishes will be fulfilled. So if you take the refuge seriously, as I mentioned earlier, you will be cultivating merit all the time. You will be practicing virtue all the time. So you, you, you are meritorious in that sense. And then there's no reason, you know, not to be fulfilled. So that's why. And you will quickly achieve Buddhahood. I don't know, quickly, mm -hmm. but you will achieve enlightenment. So these, we have covered the reasons to go for refuge. We have also identified the three objects of refuge and we also talk about the benefit and how to go for refuge but 
now that after we we have taken refuge, there are things we should and we should not do. So this is the final part, the instructions, the training, the precepts related to the individual jewels. So we have individual three jewels. So there are uh, instructions in relation to individual jewels. So first, there are should nots. We should not engage in. So the first one is, since we take refuge in Buddha, we should not seek refuge in the worldly gods. Because godly, worldly gods, they themselves are in samsara. They have not eradicated all that causes of suffering. They themselves are suffering. So if you entrust them to be your savior, there is danger. Especially worldly gods. They rely on what is called, when you please them, they will help you. <coughs> When you stop doing the things that pleases them, then they will start to harm you. So that's why I said that, don't seek refuge in worldly gods. And since you go for refuge in Dharma, we should all the time avoid harming other sentient beings, even thought of harming sentient beings. So that includes even mosquitoes, we think that they don't uh, what is that? Deserve mm. to live because mosquitoes carry <laughs> whatever reason you have. Mm. So you said you should not. And then, since we have taken refuge in Sangha, we should not associate with those holding wrong views. Wrong views are those views that contradicts our views, the Buddhist views. So the danger is that if you associate with that kind of person, and if your faith is not firm, there is a danger that, you know, you may get converted. Then you may lose faith in refuge, in three jewels. Then there is a danger. And now, what should you do then? Since you have taken refuge in Buddha, treat images of Buddha with respect. Any image, irrespective of its material. Some image may be made from mud, some may be from gold, some may be from silver. Normally, our tendency is that if it is gold or silver, we tend to revere more. We put that into a higher shelf. Whereas it is a mud statue, uh, <laughs> put it aside, you know. By saying that, we should not do that. As long as it is an image of Buddha, we should treat them the same, accord the same respect. Then since we have taken refuge in Dharma, honor the writings of the teachings. This is very obvious practice in Tibetan community, Tibetan practice. You will see Tibetan people, if they see a piece of paper or a, a written in Tibetan language, they will just pick that out. And then we will not uh, cross over any uh, text, like your prayer books there. We will not put on the ground, on the floor, we will always try to put uh, somewhere high. So we should respect that. And uh, yeah, my godmother in Malaysia, she had a very good practice. She had a separate bin for all Dharma stuff. Even though it is all printed in English, but as long as there is some Tibetan name or some Dharma thing, she has another bin. Store everything there, and then she will either bring to the center during the incense puja, she will burn it there, or she will ask people to bring it up to the retreat center there, burn it, like incense cover. Mm. All this she will store somewhere else. She won't throw in the normal bin. Mm. That's what we should be doing. 
sometimes I write scribble something on there with my name or something and then when oh no 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 she will just pick it up and put it in that way so that is how to show respect we have to keep that in mind and then since we have taken refuge in Sangha we have to revere members of the community so that's the monks and nuns so I think you must have observed in the Asian culture there's so much respect according to the Sangha community monks and nuns so this is all coming from the three jewels it is not Tibetan culture per se it is all influenced by the Dharma practice, the Buddhist practice. So in Tibetan practice, when a monk comes, they always uh, let them sit there. And people hardly sit on the same level. The lay people will always sit on the floor and let the Sangha or the monk or nun up there. There's always respect, so much respect. And then in old, old especially the old, older generation, even if they see a red patch, red cloth, because that is associated with monks' robes, so they always pick up and put it on a higher place. They will never step on it. So these are all, you know, the small practices coming from in relation to the refuge practice. So these are the practices in relation to individual three jewels. Now comes the general practice or general uh, precepts. Let me ask again, how many general precepts? Ten. Ten. Ten? Why ten? ten. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ten. Yeah, six. 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 Yeah. So the first one is Recalling the good qualities of three jewels, go for refuge again and again. So that is, you have to recall the qualities of Buddha. So when you recall and contemplate on the qualities, you get inspired. And then, yeah, with that, you go for refuge. Recalling the kindness of the three jewels, offer the first portion of your food and drink. So that's why Buddhists, we have this practice of offering, like water ball. We make offerings to uh, three jewels. So this is part of the refuge practice. And uh, yeah, again, let me bring back my godmother. She has another good practice. Every week, if she goes out to do marketing, grocery marketing she will come back and whatever food and whatever she will make offering so this is such a wonderful idea you see you are not buying specifically for offerings you are buying for your consumption but the first thing you do is to offer to three jewels so it's like killing two birds with one stone you got your please excuse me for me and but it's really th three birds. Okay. Because the third one is that you're practicing generosity in general, you are making the yes, offerings. Yes, so yes, get, yes. Get yes. That Good, point. <coughs> Good point. And our uh, Anthony does that. Hmm. I notice you see all this. <coughs> and then Jocelyn brings mm -hmm. flower offering every week. Every week. Did you notice that every week we have a different flower? <laughs> So these are very good practice. Mm -hmm. And that's why we also have this practice. Before eating anything, we offer that. So it's an offer the first portion of your food and drink. I think it's now kind of a vanishing, disappearing mm -hmm. practice. In, I think maybe 10, 20 years ago in Tibetan family, when they make the first tea, they will offer that. They have a special small cup and they will fill that up and offer on their altar. That's the practice, but I think that is now dying practice. 
I think. Do you do so that? Do yes. Very good. Very good. That's, that's what we our parents do. Very good. Very good. Impressive. Yeah. So that's what we do. Even if you cannot do that, just offer your means before bless it first. Oma, Oma, that's the blessing. And then offer. If you know how to recite, that's good. If not, just mentally offer the three jewels. That's a good practice. And you are not doing anything special for the three jewels. You have to cook it, you have to eat it. So why not use that opportunity to cultivate extra merit? And then lead others to take refuge. That is out of compassion. You know, if you see other people really you know, suffering due to their ignorance, then you try to, you know, help them to dharma. But of course, this one you have to be very skillful. This sometimes can miss mistaken as conversion. We are not for the conversion. You have to see the person's mentality, person's, person's inclinations. And then slowly, slowly, you know, if the person is showing interest, then can suggest. But cannot just say, oh, you have to be Buddhist, you know, it's so good, you know, all this thing, your problem will be solved. No. So all this, yeah, with compassion. Then whatever you do, trust in the three jewels. This is where I am coming from about this protector issue. And uh, one time His Holiness actually cried when explaining that people put so much importance on protectors rather than Buddha. So that's, that's unfortunate. That's what we tend to do. We feel that, you know, their blessing or whatever it is uh, more efficient. So that's why we, we do all this. Mm. So then here the instruction is that whatever you do, whether it's important, not important, every any activity, any welfare, trust and trust in three jewels. And our house has a very nice practice. Maybe that is also maybe other Tibetan family may have the same practice. So when when I was young, from young, I was taught that we, I was in boarding school, so we come for winter vacation. So when we go back, before we leave, my mother would always say, go to the prayer room, go into the prayer room, offer prostrations and light, offer a lamp, but a lamp. We always do that. Even now we do that. Even my sisters, when they live in uh, Delhi and our family is now in Dehradun. So when they come and before they leave, they only came for a few days. But when it's time to leave, my mother will still insist. Go to the prayer room, make prostrations and offer the light. Do you practice this? Yes. You do? Yeah, my son does that too. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. what we do. It is really interesting that, you know, you are going for uh, on journey or some some what you call venture, and you are trusting three jewels. You are making prayers to three jewels instead of you know offering this black tea. Upon understanding the benefits, go for refuge three times, three times in the day and three times at night. So in the morning, at least, of course, you can recite more than three times, but it is good to do once in the morning and then once before going to bed. And finally, maintain refuge and do not forsake the rituals, even in just or if it cost your life. So never give up refuge. I know of a friend who was married to a Christian husband. But first, she was so involved in, in the center, but eventually she had to forsake it. 
because the husband, she, she was pressured into it. For the sake of keeping your husband happy. So she just forsake that and she became a Christian. That still, I mean, there is some justification. But some people for wealth and all that, you just forsake. You let go of this. If they say, oh, you know, yeah, this, this will be a good test, you know. Let's say if somebody is going to give you $5 million to say that if you join our group, would you go? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a real test. So here is saying that no matter, even if it's costing your life, if somebody says that if you don't convert, I'm going to shoot you, he said that you should not give up. Wow, it's 12.13 already. Hmm. Can I have a question? Sure. I have a couple of questions. One, um, uh, when we were speaking about the speech of Buddha, mm -hmm. I was wondering about the story of uh, his nonverbal answering. <laughs> and I was wondering, if is that considered speech? No, that's not really speech. That's that more considered? of a mind. Fine. That's mind. Quality that's of mind. mind. I thought so. That's yeah, so what Anthony was asking about is, there was this debate because there were incidents where Buddha was asked whether there exists independent self. Buddha did not answer. Buddha kept quiet. So the other people said, oh, you see, Buddha is not omniscient. He couldn't answer that question. But then others saying that his remaining silence is actually proves that he is omniscient mm -hmm. because he knows that if he answer yes, it will harm some group of people. If you say no, it will also affect some people in a negative way. So that's why he realized that the best way is to remain silent. So if we don't have that clairvoyance or omniscient mind, we wouldn't know. We would say, that, uh, yeah, it is there, you know, whatever it is. The other question is, um, uh, regarding the other two refuges, Bhajana, which is the Yidam and the Guru. Mm. Um, could you say a few words on the other two? Yeah, so the Yidam is also in part of Buddha. So whatever is under the, uh, what do you call the omniscient mind or whatever is the perfected wisdom, so that comes under Buddha. And uh, of course, Tibetan version, we have this uh, Lama like Yangsu Chow. So Lama represents Guru. So because Buddha cannot come that often in that form, so another way is to help sentient beings, because Buddha, as we said, that his main goal is to help sentient beings. So another manifest, I mean, another emanation or whatever you call that, is to manifest in the form of Guru, and then teach and help sentient beings. So that's why the Gurus are for. So then, Yidam is a manifestation in a tantric form, or? Yeah, I mean, Yidam, all that, Doji Chikji, and all these, we, we, we classify as Yidam. So these are tantric deities, oh. yeah. So it's, of course, the Buddha we talk about is from the, the point of Sutrayana. Sutrayana. Mm. Okay. Let's say tantric Buddhas. <laughs> Anything? Any more? Okay. 